Yeah, I guess by way of background, I work, I'm a partner in a firm called Media Arts Lawyers and we're probably the biggest music firm in the country. So I look after people like Flume and Chet Faker and Flight Facilities and Boy and Bear, whole lot of bands like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, obviously we do a fair bit of, we have to deal with sample clearance a fair bit. So I guess the thing that a lot of people will ask first up is, when do I have to clear a sample? So a lot of people have a bit of a, a rule of thumb in their mind that you know, you're allowed to sample up to a certain number of seconds of, of a recorded work or of a composition before you have to clear it. It's not quite true. The reality is as soon as it's identifiable, probably practically you need to clear it. Um, there's language in the Copyright Act which is probably a bit fiddly to go into today, but for all intents and purposes, if it's recognisable by someone listening to the music, then you're going to be probably infringing on their copyright. So as in if you don't clear the sample, you'll be infringing on their copyright. Um, the other thing that people often find it a bit hard to get their heads around is that there's actually two copyrights involved in most exploitations of recorded music. So I guess an easy way, well hopefully an easy way to think of it is that there's a song and then there's the recording of the song. And in electronic music sometimes it seems not as, as obvious but an easy way to, to describe it or explain it might be to think about you know, a Beatles song so that Lennon McCartney wrote the song Let It Be but we could do a recorded version of that song here today, as in we could program some, some drums and put down some keys and track a gang vocal with everyone here. And there'd be two separate copyrights. There'd be the copyright that already existed, which is the copyright of the song, which is the top line melody um, and the lyrics of the song. But then we'd have created a new copyright in our recording of the song. So I guess what that means for samples is that every time you're sampling someone else's recording, if, we wanted to, if someone here wanted to then sample that recording we just made, it's actually two copyrights you've got to clear. You have to co come to, if it was Adam and, and I doing the recording, you have to come to us and say, hey, I want to clear a sample of your recording. But simultaneously you have to go to, the, to Sony ATV or whoever's controlling the Beatles catalogue and say, hey, we also want to clear our sample of, of the composition. So every time you're sampling a recording, you're going to be sampling a composition at the same time. Um, so what that means is when, if et cetera, et cetera, are going to clear those samples, um, on the EP, it means they're not just going to the record company of the recording artist, they're going to be going to the publishers as well. And in terms of what that looks like or how difficult or easy that is, I guess there's no definitive answer. There's lots of people, um, and we do it, but there's people in the US who do it. You, there's people who clear samples and will give you a flat fee and say, hey, this is what it would cost for us to go and work out who owns the copyright, for us to get in contact with them, and for us to try and negotiate you a sample clearance. But a lot of the time it kind of comes down to who the artist is, who the label is and, and who the publisher is. Because most artists, if you've been well represented in your deals, you'll have creative approval over any samples. I, if someone wants to come and sample our recording we've just made, we would have the right to say no. So even if you said to the label, hey, I'll, I'll give you $10,000 up front to let me use it, Adam and I might still say, nah, we're not into that. We're not giving approval. You can't clear it. So sometimes you go to clear samples and you just can't. As in, it's, you literally, they won't agree. Other times, because it's a commercial negotiation, you're dealing with someone else's rights, sometimes it's just prohibitively expensive. So sometimes a label will say, if it's a major, they'll say, if it's a publisher, they might say, well, yeah, you can use this snippet of the song in your song, in this new composition you've created. Um, I suppose an easier example is if we took, you know, the chorus, or, you know, let's say a, a fraction of the chorus of Let It Be and wrote a whole new song around it. So we wrote new lyrics and other new melodies around it. We would say, oh, we've created a new song. Yes, we've got a little bit of your song in it. We've also created a new melody and lyrics. The publisher might say, well, yeah, we'll let you use it as we won't stop you from using it and sue you, but only on the basis that we own 100% of the new work that you've created. So that's a pretty common position that major label publishers will try and take. Um, and similarly with the recording, they might say, yes, we'll, we'll grant you clearance in it, but we want to, yes, we want to have a royalty rate on everything you do with that recording and we want you to pay us up front a lump sum advance on that, as we want you to pay us $5,000, you know, in good faith to show that it's worth our while to even let you do this. So, and then other times people say, you know, fine, I don't want anything. I give you approval and I don't want to have any share of your work and I don't want any advances. So it very much comes down to who you, whose work you're sampling. Um, and I guess the other, um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and you see that when people talk about being bogged down in trying to clear samples, so like Avalanche's records, you know, they talk about spending years trying to clear tracks and records. But you've got 20 samples on a record, and you've got 20 different rights owners all angling for their slice of, of the copyrights. You can 
understand why it would take a long time. And then when people say no, you've got to try and work out what you want to do, as in whether you're going to try and create a new work that doesn't have that reference in it and doesn't have that recording in it. So sometimes it's not as simple as just re-recording it because you might still be using their composition. Um, there's people, for example, there's a group called, are they called Replay Heaven? Something like that. Do you know those guys? Yeah. There's a few different groups in the States, other ones I've dealt with and come across that uh, for, for a flat fee up front, you'll send them the sample you want to use and they'll say, okay, well, we can re-record the audio file as in the master recording exactly and we'll, depending on what that sample is and how complex it is, they'll charge you. But often they'll go in and research where it was recorded originally with what mics, through what gear, and they'll try and recreate the exact sonic effect. So it's not just you trying to do something that sounds vaguely like it, but they're theoretically delivering you a recording that is identical and you don't have to clear – so then you don't have to clear one side of the copyright. You still got to go to the publisher and you can't get around that. Um, but often if you go to the publisher, get it cleared, then go to the record label and they say either no or a prohibitively large expense, you might go, you know what, it's probably better paying three grand to someone to, to recreate this thing perfectly and I own all the rights and never have to worry about it again versus giving someone a share of my copyright and paying fees and, and all that kind of stuff. Just a quick question on that. So there's two types of publishing. There's the, the song and then the recording. So that's the, the publishing and the, and the mechanical copyright, yeah? Uh, sort of. The publishing is the song. So yep. the publishing, the exploitation of the composition refers is, is called publishing. Like yep. That's kind of the colloquial term. So again, the easiest way to think of it is it doesn't need to be recorded. So we can sit here and play it on... If we can sit here and play it on a guitar without ever making a recorded version of it, that's the song. So that's the top line melody and the lyrics. Then the recording of the song, which you know, historically has been through, through microphones onto tape and onto you know, other storage devices and, and obviously more and more now is onto laptops and digital files, that's the copyright in the recording. So when you do a deal with a record label, you're actually doing a deal for your recording rights. So, yeah. So the question here is, uh, are they equal? So... If, if you did have uh, the, you know, re-record Heaven or whoever yeah. they are, uh, replace the mechanical recording, uh, re replace a recorded version for you with an original yeah. played version of that song, um, have you just halved your expenses or... Yeah, potentially. Yeah? Okay. But it's not always 50% of half and half. Not, not necessarily. So typically, you know, the... Because often, because it's a commercial negotiation, often it depends on how successful you are and how successful the act is that wants... That whose work you want to use because you can imagine if you're Kanye West and you come to one of us and say, I want to sample one of your songs, you'd be happy to give them the smallest slice in the world because you know it's going to sell a huge number of copies and it's going to be very, very good for you and your career and you're going to earn a whole lot of money from it. Flip side is, if we go to Daft Punk and say, hey, we want to do our own Kanye West style re you know, rework of one of your tracks, they go, eh, either no, we don't want to do it because we don't need you doing it, like it's not going to help our reputation and or if you do want to do it, this is a very, very valuable copyright. People are going to buy this new work because it's got us on it, not because you're doing it. So therefore, we want to control the majority of it and, and be the ones that benefit from it. So I guess, broadly speaking, if the songwriter and the recording artist are the same, yeah, probably they're equally difficult to clear or equally, you know, it's the value of the two copyrights is similar. But another way to, to think about it is when, if you ever see TV ads where they have like, uh, Denny Hines singing Can't Get You Out of My Head like that To His Extra Dry commercial a couple of years ago the reason they did that is because the song's worth of absolute fortune because it was the number one hit worldwide and it's a well known song so they had to pay for it because they wanted to use that song but they didn't want to pay the same a similar amount again to use the recording as in the definitive recording the Kylie Minogue recording they might have paid 200 grand to license the song they didn't want to have to pay another 200 grand so they would have probably given Denny Hines 5 grand and spent another five grand and had a new recording of the song for 10 grand. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good. Good deal. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, a slightly trickier question here. Um, the law is the law, right? Uh, as you yeah. will be aware of, um, you know, day in and day out with your job. Uh, as this, this might be a, um, you know, a, a bit of a myth, like um, one of those uh, urban legends, but... Um, the story was uh, well told in two ways: either that um, that it wasn't until black people started sampling white people that um, 
that the lawyers got involved. So, you know, when Steinsky and all those <coughs> those guys were doing all their cut-ups and edits and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, they were sampling James Brown, but, yeah, yeah. you know, nobody was getting uh, paid. But then when it's De La Soul sampling, you know, Hall & Oates and all that sort of stuff, it, it's it's changed the uh, the the uh, message. But, um, uh, but then at the sort of other end of uh, history, sort of this end, now that it's there's less money in music um, and there's SoundCloud and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it seems to be edits everywhere and people even letting you download it, yeah, yeah. people even pressing it to vinyl, that sort of stuff. Has, has the, uh, so the law hasn't changed, but has the veracity of how it's going to be pursued changed? Yeah, what you find is typically artists aren't suing other artists. It's not like you, people hear their song being played somewhere else and decide they want to sue them. And the reason probably why... Uh, if if that is how it's played out in history, why white artists uh, plundering black copyrights weren't being sued is because probably there was no one there to actually represent those rights and and commercially enforce them. What you find is like all the big there's not that many musical matters that end up in court because you know to go to to sue someone and to run it to full course of litigation can cost anywhere from you know 100 grand to to millions. There's not often that many copyrights or that big a dispute that's worth it. And the reason the Men at Work case, you know, went to went to trial recently was just because that was a worldwide number one and, you know, was the biggest selling hit of 1984 or whatever year it came out and there was enough there to justify people having these fights. But it's very, very rarely the artists were fighting about it. It's the record companies and the, the people who own and control these rights who are largely corporations and, and making commercial decisions about whether it's going to make sense to sue and to go to all that expense to enforce it. So what you find is if you're, you know, doing an edit of someone's track and you're not making any money from it and it's not costing them anything and they're not foregoing sales, you know, very often no one's going to do anything about it. Just like when blogs put up major label content, you know, the major label might send them a takedown notice, but often they won't do anything. They'll say, well, you know, I'm not sure this is really costing as much. The people who are downloading these things aren't lost sales probably in our mind and it's promoting the work, we'll let it go and until or unless it reaches a point where we think it's causing us commercial harm. So I guess the short answer is it depends how much is at stake. I mean, there was that George Harrison uh, was a famous, famously got sued by the, was it, I can't remember what it was, the Shangri-La, someone, for his song My Sweet, My Sweet Lord. And he said, you know, if this is a copyright infringement, if I've ripped off someone and that's enough to get me sued, then, then every single songwriter in the world you know, could be getting sued by someone else. And in reality, that's probably right. I mean, you know, I'm sure everyone in their musical uh, listenings is going, God, that song sounds like this. Like, that's pre pretty much the same chorus as this song. Or, you know, that's verse melody is identical. But what you find is unless it goes on to be, you know, a massive hit, it's probably unlikely that anyone's going to do anything about it. Um, because, again, it's th those kinds of things about enforcement often are about, um, you know, commercial value. So... We represent Goitier, so obviously, you know, that song, um, somebody that is, you know, being such a phenomenal hit, I mean, that's, that sample which, you know, runs through the entire song was cleared after the fact because the song was such a hit. Um, you know, I dare say, without revealing any of Wally's secrets, but there's, his music's probably laden with samples that he never worries about clearing because he thinks either no one's going to hear it, as in no one's going to be able to identify what the thing he sampled is, or you know, it's not going to come to the attention of the sample owners because they're obscure enough. So that actually brings up another really uh, good point. The, um, at what point do you clear something? Uh, my, my first release, um, uh, we, had a, we had an a cappella um, and it was just going out on white label. There were like 500 copies went out. But then uh, that gentleman there over there in the corner picked it up and wanted to put it on a compilation that then got signed to uh, Ministry of Sound and uh, all this sort of stuff back in the day. Uh, and at that point, we had to clear it. Um, and we actually had two versions. We had one with um, the acapella and then one with the acapella and a big band thing. We couldn't clear the big band thing, but we went to the acapella guy, some guy in Denmark, I think, yeah. um, uh, who was A, astounded that we actually wanted to sample it in the first place, um, but B, he realised that we'd already pressed up 500 copies. So our position for being able to negotiate anything was yeah. a lot uh, diminished. We had to basically take whatever he was going to put on the table, which he was, he was quite fair with, so, which was yeah. lucky for us. But at what point, because everybody <coughs> here has probably got hard drives full of stuff that they've 
chopped and dropped into live sets and started looping them up and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, you don't have to clear anything to do that, but when is the wisest strategically? Yeah, that's a good question because definitely if it's going to come to the attention of the copyright owner that you've used their copyright in your song, uh, if they're finding out about it after the fact, after it's been commercially released, you've got no bargaining power. Like they're well within their rights, obviously, to, to sue you for the copyright infringement, but also to have it taken off every shelf wherever it's been released around the world, have the vinyl recalled, you know, send threatening letters to your record company and your publisher who, who are then going to freak out and, you know, want to pull the release entirely. So there's no question that if you've got samples to clear and you're going to commercially release stuff, the best time to negotiate is before you release it because then if you are having the discussion with a copyright owner and if they're big enough, they're not going to care either way and they're just going to tell you to go screw yourself. But for a lot of people, they, they want you to sample their work in the sense that they're going to have a share of a new copyright, they're potentially going to be getting a fee for you to do it or a share of income from it. So if, they're sa if you're saying, well, hey, we want to clear this song and this recording, like this is what we propose the terms to be, if they come back with something that's, that you can't do, that you can't afford or isn't agreeable, you don't think it's a reasonable deal, you can still turn around at that point and pull those samples from your recording or from your work. And, and they know that and you'll communicate that to them and say, well, you know, for what you guys are asking for, these, for this clearance, eh, we're not going to do it. Like, if you can come back down to here, yeah, we can make a deal. Otherwise, don't worry about it. We've got other songs. We're not going to release this. Whereas, once a song's A, released, or B, even worse, not for you, but for your clearance terms, climbing up the charts, then you're really in trouble. Um, that's, that Bauer song... Harlem, is it Shake or Harlem Shake? Harlem Shake, yeah. Harlem Shake, which you showed me originally. Uh, so that has uncleared samples in it. And, you know, because that song became such a huge phenomenon from the, the going viral online, um, I was talking to the attorney that represents Bauer um, in New York and he was like, I have one week a year where I turn my phone off and American attorneys, like, they'll write you back emails at 4 a.m. on a Sunday night. Like, they never turn their phones off. He's like, I have one week a year. He said he flew to Costa Rica he flew somewhere else into the mountains to go surfing. He's like, there's no internet, there's no nothing. The song breaks, this sample was, the sample issue comes up and I've got literally every person who's ever done anything in the music world harass me going, we have to clear this, we have to clear this, this is going to like cost us so much money. So he said, he ended up having to set up this, got set up with this tent and this satellite dish up on top of this hill in Costa Rica. And he said, I was there for a week and I worked seven days, you know, kind of 16, 17 hours around the clock. And he said, all these Costa Ricans worked out what I was doing as in worked out why I was there and all knew the song and we were holding boom boxes outside his tent <laughs> playing Harlem <out of> Shake. <laughs> so like, you know, trying to clear that stuff then or, you know, after the fact when it's a hit is, you know, a massive mind mill because there's so much value at stake. Whereas when you're doing it at the front when there's no value at stake, people are much more cavalier about it and like, yeah, well, we can agree that. Yeah. Uh, there's actually another sort of,